morning and welcome to Worship Online at Alzheimer Baptist Church. We're really glad that you have joined us today. Our call to worship. Let us praise God the Creator, who is filled with glory and power, with holiness and splendor. Let us worship God the Savior, who is filled with love and compassion, with justice and peace. Let us experience God the Spirit, who is fill, fills us with faith and joy, with love and eternal life. Let's pray. God who created the world, Jesus, the Son given for the world, Holy Spirit ever present in the world, be with us in our worship that we may know the fullness of the Holy One as God lives in the triune community so that we may live in communion with God and each other. Amen. We're thrilled this morning to have uh, Anna and Pastor Sebastian joining us as we sing together, and uh, I invite you to uh, join together as we sing in worship. together you don't know what that does to this pastor's heart when you miss praying together corporately and so we're going to take some time this morning to do that and I invite you to join together in prayer Lord
Blessed Trinity, God our Father, our Creator, our Provider, Jesus the Son, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Healer, and Holy Spirit, our Comforter, our Convictor, and our ever-present one, we thank you. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for your presence amongst your church, your people, wherever we are around the world today. We acknowledge our incredible need of you. And we thank you for the privilege of being your beloved children, so loved and cared for. We thank you that you invite us into a deep and intimate relationship with you, each one, each one of us and with each one of you. What a privilege. We acknowledge this morning that we are not worthy of that privilege, for we have sinned against you in so many ways. And we ask that you forgive us. Forgive us for the sins that we have committed knowingly, and for our pride in thinking it doesn't matter, or it's okay. For the sins that we have committed unknowingly, make us aware of those. We're particularly conscious of our complicity in racism and in not valuing our brothers and sisters or our neighbors. Forgive us. And as we listen to your message and prepare to come to your table, Lord, we long to come in a manner that is worthy, and we acknowledge with gratitude that when we ask for forgiveness, you are always faithful and just, and forgive us. And you welcome us back into that relationship with you that we crave. There are many of us this morning who are grieving. We think of the Cass family grieving the loss of father and husband and grandfather and friend. And we pray that you will be with them and with each of us as we grieve Richard's loss. We think of others who are also grieving. Marilyn and Wilf grieving the loss of a very dear friend. And many of us grieving the loss of dreams, the loss of plans. And we know that you are with each and every one of us as we grieve and you understand it. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for your comfort and for the fact that when we, as the Altador Baptist Church family, cannot be with each other physically, you are their God. And we pray, we pray that you will bring healing to all of those who are suffering from COVID particularly those who have lost loved ones around the world and in our midst. We long to get back together as a family of God here to worship you together, Lord. May you bring solutions and opportunities. We pray that you will help us to continue to be your hands and feet to the community that you have put us in. 
both in our own neighborhoods and in the neighborhood where you have planted this church. May we feel your leading and your guiding and your presence. And may we share that ever abiding love you shower upon us and the blessings that you shower upon us. May we be quick to share them with others, drawing people to that intimate relationship with you. We praise your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. As you might have figured out already, it is Trinity Sunday and we're concentrating on God, uh, the triune God this morning. And so we will sing some songs about that. And we also, on Communion Sundays, quite often we'll say uh, one of the creeds or we'll sing it. And that's what we're going to do now. And so I invite you to sing, uh, I believe, and we're going to sing it as we believe this morning. Thank you. Scripture this reading is from the book of 1 John, reading starting in chapter 3, speaking from verse 21 all the way to the end of chapter 4, verse 16. 
And I'll be reading from the message translation this morning. And friends, once that's taken care of, and we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves, we're, we are bold and free before God. We are able to stretch our hands out and receive what he asks for us, because we are doing what he said, doing what pleases him. Again, this is God's command, to believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. He told us to love each other in line with the original command. As we keep his commands, we live deeply and surely in him, and he lives in us. And this is how we experience his deep and abiding presence in us, by the spirit he gave us. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship from God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God, because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. And this is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God, ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us, and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him, and he in us. He's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit. Also, we've seen for ourselves and continued to to state openly that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's Son participates continuously in an intimate relationship with God. We know it so well. We've embraced it heart and soul. This love that comes from God.
the end of our message this morning, we are going to celebrate communion together. So if you uh, do not have um, juice or wine, bread or cracker with you, I, I invite you to pause the video and prepare and then come in back and join us as our message leads us toward this communion. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, for we are listening. Still our busy minds so that we may hear your message and be touched by you. Amen. So as I said, today is Trinity Sunday. It is also by tradition in our church, Communion Sunday. And it's not very often that the two coincide, but it does today. And that gives us a good reason to think about our communion a little bit differently. Each time we come to this table of the Lord, we come in remembrance of Jesus and in obedience to his command that we do this until he comes again. However, it's always good to come to this table with a bit of a different perspective and let God speak to us through it and giving us new insights through the power of the Holy Spirit. Last month, when we were talked about uh, the brokenness that is represented at, at this table in all of the elements here, Christ's body broken for our sin, the wheat is broken and made into bread and then broken for us, and that is what we partake in, symbolic of the broken body of Christ. The grapes are broken to produce the juice or the wine, symbolic of Christ's blood, shed for each one of us to atone for our sin. And we ourselves come to this table recognizing our own brokenness, our sinfulness, and our need for Christ's saving grace. The world in which we live is also broken. And Jesus Christ's salvation and redemption is what we remember when we come to this table. And it's highlighted even further in these days. This month, we're going to think about the Trinity represented here. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we acknowledge that this is a difficult concept to understand. And so because of this, we often need to take it by faith, knowing that what God tells us is true. N.T. Wright speaks about Trinity Sunday in a wonderful way. He says, in the church's year, Trinity Sunday is the day when we stand back from the extraordinary sequence of events that we've been celebrating for the previous five months. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Good Friday, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost. And then when we rub the sleep from our eyes, we discover what the word God might actually mean. These events function as a sequence of a well-aimed hammer blows, which knock at the clay jars of the gods we want, the gods we reinforce in our own pride and prejudice, until they fall away and reveal instead a very different God, a dangerous God, a subversive God, a triune God, a God who comes to us like blind beggar with his wounds in his hands, a God who comes in to us in wind and fire, in bread and wine, in flesh and blood, a God who says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. He continues, you see, the doctrine of the Trinity, properly understood, is as much a way of saying we don't know as a way of saying we do know. To say that the true God is three and one is to recognize that there, there is a God, then of course we shouldn't expect him to fit neatly into our little categories. If he did, he wouldn't be God at all, merely a God, a God we might perhaps have wanted. The Trinity is not something that clever theologian comes up with as a result of hours spent in the theological laboratories, 
after which he or she can return to the announcement that they got God all worked out now. The analysis is complete, and here is God neatly laid out on a, on a slab. The only time they laid God on a slab, he rose again three days afterwards. On the contrary, and he right, continues, the doctrine of the Trinity is, if you like, a signpost pointing ahead into the dark, saying, trust me, follow me, my love will keep you safe. Or perhaps better, the doctrine of the Trinity is a signpost pointing into a light which gets brighter and brighter until we are dazzled and blinded, by which says, come and I will make you children of light. The doctrine of the Trinity affirms the rightness, the propriety of speaking intelligently, that the true God must always transcend our grasp of him, even our most intelligent grasp of him." End quote. So we welcome this triune God into our midst and we acknowledge that we, even though we don't understand it, we need this God of love. For that's exactly what this is all about. Love. God's love. And it's all about the Trinity. That gives us the perfect example of what it means to live in community to a perfect commune and a perfect love. The Father loves the Son and gives him everything. The Son always does what that which pleases the Father, and the Spirit takes the things of the Son and he shows them to us. And this is all about relationship. Each person matters. And in the perfect community of the Trinity, we see that. One is not more important than the other, and they each serve the other in perfect harmony, and they set that example for us. When we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are introduced to the relationships that exist within the Trinity. We just read, God is love, which means that the relationships of the Trinity are about love, they are other-centered, and they are sacrificial. The persons within the Trinity enjoy an eternal and joyful communion and would like us to do the same. God, our Creator and Father, sent His Son to atone for our sins once and forever. Sebastian read for us in verses 9 and 10, This is how God showed His love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. He sent Jesus to make a way for us, you and me, to be able to walk in a close relationship with him and to commune with him forever. Commune. The root word for communion and for community. Verse 16, everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's son participates continually in an intimate relationship with God. That was our Heavenly Father's intent when he created us, for us to live in an intimate communion with him. The Trinity, God the Son, in obedience to God the Father, died on the cross for our sins so that we could live in that relationship with the triune God. Christ fulfilled all the requirements of the law as the perfect sacrifice. In doing so, he, we are assured of our salvation when we believe in him. Also, by doing so, he gave glory and honor to God the Father. We come to Jesus at the cross, recognizing that we are all sinners, each one of us in need of the salvation and grace that can only come through the events of the cross. 
we come recognizing that at the foot of the cross, we are all equal. And that Jesus longs to walk in relationship with every person. We also come knowing that we have failed to live as God would have us do. Our sin causes so many consequences and distances us from the intimacy God desires for us to have with him. Michael Welker writes, at the cross, we learn that the good law of God can, under the power of sin, be completely misused and distorted. People distance themselves individually and communally from God's presence. In doing so, they even spread the appearance of justice, piety, and political necessity and public consensus. We've certainly seen that this week, haven't we? The appearance of justice and piety has been demolished and condemned. Racism is never, never, ever acceptable. It is sin. And it is often caused because people are distancing themselves both individually and corporately from God's presence from God's purposes, and from God's commands. Oh God, forgive us for sin and for our complicity and our help us to understand better and have the courage to stand for justice. The third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus, the Spirit is our advocate and God's ever-abiding presence on earth and in us, his children. It is through the work of the Holy Spirit that we recognize our sin and we confess it. This is something we should always do before we come to this table, the Lord's table. Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians 11. Come in a worthy manner which is what happens when we heed the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This week, as we come to this table, I hope you have done that. And I pray that you have asked the Holy Spirit to illuminate places in your life where there is unconfessed sin. For me, the events of the past week have highlighted my own complicity in not standing for justice and allowing racism to be prevalent in our city and our country and our world. So in my confession this morning, as I come to this table, I had to include that too. If you have not spent time preparing to come to the Lord's table today, Maybe pause this video for a few moments and spend some time asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate the sins that you need to confess so that you may come to the Lord's table in a worthy manner. And everyone is welcome at this table if you confess Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit also comforts us intercedes for us, as we talked about last week, and helps us to build unity in community. Michael Welker again, the Holy Spirit establishes a community in which faith, love, and hope are alive. It creates a community in which justice, the protection of the weak, and the knowledge of God and of the truth are forever sought anew. Under the power of the working of the Holy Spirit, the search for God and love of God become concrete. God's Spirit persistently works against unjust differences. It transforms and revitalizes natural and cultural differences, which go along with injustice, uncharitableness, racism, and hopelessness. This, however, does not mean that the Holy Spirit simply does away with differences. Rather, the unity of the Holy Spirit is the unity in the interplay of the different gifts of the Spirit. Finally, the Trinity invites 
all of us, as individuals and as the church, into a deep, deep relationship with him. We are people built for relationship, never meant to be an island. And unfortunately, in this world, there's too many islands right now. And if that's you, find a way to connect with people and with God, because we are built for relationship. And relationship is the essence of our existence. When God made this world, he spun it out of the web of relationships. Once again, the Trinity showing us what it means to live in perfect relationship one with another. The Father loved the world so much that he sent his one and only Son. And the Son went to the cross in obedience to the Father. And the Spirit went into the world to glorify the Son. The Son is glorified by the Spirit, and the Father is glorified by the Son, and the persons in the Trinity are glorifying each other. This is love, other-centered love. And apart from the existence of this perfect, eternal love, there can be no explanation for love in our world. And the priority is God's love. God's love is the acid test of our discipleship, isn't it? Love one another, love other family members, love your brothers and sisters in Christ, love your neighbors, love your enemies, love no matter race or color or creed. Love, if we love each other, we belong to Jesus Christ, our scriptures told us. The relationships within the Trinity are relationships of love. We love one another. Because we are made in the image of our triune God. So loving one another is more than a nice, polite thing to do. As we love each other, we are imitating God himself. Here, at this table, God the Father, creator of all. God the Son, whose death and resurrection we celebrate and remember at this table and God the Holy Spirit, who helps us to come to this table, prepared to celebrate God's presence. Essential to the Trinity, as I've said, is communion. A perfect communion between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Lord's Supper is an impressive mirror that allows us to find a deep appreciation for the working of the triune God. This should lead us to a deep sense of gratitude for the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How much work has God done to attune us, to attune the course of nature and human culture so that bread and wine can be made? How much work has Jesus done to bring humans, us, together peacefully to concentrate together on his presence. How much work has been done by the Holy Spirit to enable human beings to share the gifts of creation and the gift of the word of God and to listen to the word and to each other, to understand the word and each other and to glorify God and love each other. And so we come. We come to this table. It is the Lord's table where we join together in community and unity. And if you believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Let us pray. Triune God of love, present with each one of us where we are. We celebrate, we remember, and we come, longing for those intimate relationships with you and with each other. 
Pour out your spirit upon us again and fill us with your love so that it will overflow to all we meet. We thank you for the blessing of being able to come freely, forgiven and holy in your eyes, Lord. We give you the honor and glory that you alone are worthy. Amen. We read in scripture, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to partake together of the bread, symbolic of Christ's body broken for you. In the same way, after he suffered, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite you to take your cup. Christ's blood, shed for the remission of the sins of all people everywhere, for you and for me. And be thankful. Amen. We're going to sing as our closing hymn the doxology familiar first verse and familiar tune but there are three verses that have significant meaning so we encourage you to join us as we praise god from whom all blessings flow mm -hmm.
May the blessing of the God of peace and justice be with us. May the blessing of the Son who weeps the tears of the world's suffering be with us. And may the blessing of the Holy Spirit who inspires us to reconciliation and hope be with us from now into eternity. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit goes with us into the world. Amen. <laughs>